Good morning again. There's a few of you awake. I know. I heard you. Wasn't looking, but good morning. And, um, you know, that song, uh, if I, my memory serves correctly, uh, was uh, David Crowder, and he wrote that song. He had uh, been at a, a salvation party where they sometimes throw these parties where uh, people are saved and they sort of join with heaven that the party's going on there and they throw kind of a big party for that person and that's the testimony was this uh, prisoner or a guy who went to prison God changed his life in prison and and, and Crowder heard the song and, and then wrote it I believe and then um, but what a testimony to and the connection that we have as all believers that the Lord Jesus has set us free amen and that's what we're going to see a little bit here in uh, our text this morning, is that the battle has been won, and we're going to pick up at the end of Gideon's story. So if you have your copy of God's Word, go ahead and turn there with me to Gen uh, Judges, not Genesis, Judges chapter 8, and we're going to look at uh, a few verses starting in verse 22. Judges chapter 8, starting in verse 22, hear the Word of the Lord. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, you and your son and your grandson also, for you have saved us from the hand of Midian. And Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, and my son will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. And Gideon said to them, Let me make a request of you. Every one of you give me the earrings from his spoil, for they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. And they answered, We will willingly give them. And they spread a cloak, and every man threw in it the earrings of his spoil. And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold. Besides the crescent ornaments and the pendants and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian, and besides the collars that were around the necks of their camels. And Gideon made an ephod of it and put it in his city in Ophrah. And all Israel whored after it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and to his family." So Midian was subdued before the people of Israel, and they raised their heads no more, and the land had rest forty years in the days of Gideon. Pray with me. Father, we once again thank you in the midst of a confusing time, a frustrating maybe time, and just downright exhausting time in our country today. We thank you that you give us the calm assurance of your sure and steady and always prevalent reign over everything. We ask that you would help us this morning to focus our mind's attention and our heart's affection on the person and the work of your Son, Jesus Christ, and that by your Holy Spirit, you would grant us your peace that passes all understanding, and that you would even grant someone eternal life here this morning. And we ask all of this in the life-giving name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, how has your week been? <laughs> if you're like every other American, right? Uh, no matter who you voted for, you just want to move on, right? Maybe you feel like this cartoon that I saw earlier this week. Throw that up there. Uh, the end is near. Well, good. I can't wait for this election to be over. <laughs> Maybe that's what you feel like. No, I do. It seems like election day has turned into election week and, and maybe months and who knows, but there's good news. At least we don't have to hear the incessant campaign ads that are breaking in every few seconds in every area of our life. And I thought there was good news. Uh, I got a pin the other day, right, instead of a sticker, like many of you did. But I got a government pin on Tuesday. It stopped working on Wednesday. <laughs> Sounds about right, right? No. It, it really doesn't work right now, but, you know, it doesn't surprise me. So, but, that's where we are today. And anyhow, I'm not here to talk about politics uh, per se, but to just pass over what is happening in our country in this moment in our history, I think would be to miss one of the greatest opportunities that the church in America has to respond well, no matter who eventually comes out as the winner uh, in the White House. In fact, as followers of Christ, we all know we need to be reminded at times like this that uh, our king does not reside at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Our king, according to the Bible, sits enthroned 
to the right hand of the Father, and He is there interceding on our behalf right now. So no matter who eventually wins, whether it is your candidate or another candidate, you have an opportunity. I would even go so far that if you are a follower of Christ, we have an obligation to respond well in the midst of this particular presidential election. So this morning, we're going to pick up at the end of Gideon's story. God called him to lead uh, Midian to defeat, I mean, God called him to lead Israel to defeat Midian, uh, and he eventually answers that call. His, his army defeats the Midianite kings, and there's peace in the land for 40 years, it tells us. And what I want us to look at this morning is how Israel and Gideon responded to a favorable outcome in their political battle. Yes, it was a political battle here because every political war or every war, uh, the way we explain what is happening and the decisions that are made are what we call politics. And that's what's happening in their, their country right now. And in the case of Israel here, the outcome was favorable, but how they responded was not and so the title of today's message is, uh, it says how to respond if your ca presidential can candidate wins. I meant to change that to win or lose, how Christians should respond in a presidential election. Win or lose, how Christians should respond in a presidential election. And I believe this message is still the same for Christians, whether your candidate wins or loses, the response should, should still be the same. We, as Christians, do not panic, do we? No. We do not riot. Instead, win or lose, we treat others the way that we want to be treated. We still have a mission on this earth for the cause of Christ, and we still love the Lord, and we are to serve others at this time. And as a way of note, as we progress through this, I'm not referring here to dealing with the emotions that we experience, whether we win or lose. Of course, one would be happy, right, and maybe relieved if their particular candidate won, and, uh, or maybe that there's anxiety and, and frustration and, and maybe even uh, you know, uh, fear, maybe, anxiety, that if the candidate does not win. But those emotions depend on how you, that particular person in that race does. What we want to look at specifically this morning is the unchanging nature of our response no matter who wins. As followers of Christ, we have an opportunity and an obligation to carry on the mission of Christ no matter who sits in the White House. So I see three responses that we must have as Christians in the midst of this presidential election. Um, and number one, let's look at the first one here we see. Number one, know that the Lord is the reason for your success or the comfort during the challenge times. He is either the reason for the success or your comfort during challenging times. Look with me in verse 22 and 23. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us and your son and your grandson also, for you have saved us from the hand of Midian. And Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you and my son will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. So in the storyline here, we have, like I said, fast-forwarded past the defeat of the Midianite army here uh, under uh, Gideon's command. And in chapter 7 and, and the signs of the fleece there, God takes those 32,000 men that had shown up and he reduces their number to 300 guys now. And they each took a torch and a jar, and they surrounded uh, uh, the, the camp, and, and they broke their jars, they, they had their trumpet, they blasted their trumpet. And when the signal was given, they did all that. And then verse, chapter 7, verse 21 tells kind of a, it's a cause and effect, but it, gets it, in re, it does it in reverse. It's an effect, then cause. So verse 22 is what happened. When they blew the, the 300 trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his comrade and against all the enemy. And then verse 21 is telling us what was the result of that. Every man, that's Israel, stood in his place around the camp and all the army ran. They all cried out and fled. So all the army did of Israel was to blow their trumpets and break the jars and they stood in their place while God confused and overcame over 100,000 enemy combatants with 300 guys. Now, this is super important here in our text because the outcome and the result of their celebration, what did they do? They 
came to Midian and said, you saved us, Gideon. You did it. And Gideon has to be thinking, I didn't do anything. <laughs> like, I gathered an army, and there were 32,000. I thought we had a chance, you know, one-third of 100,000, you know, or we're, we're pretty close to that. And then God takes us down to 300, and then all he, he wanted us to do was just blow some trumpets and break some jars. And he told us to sit there and watch. Can you imagine what's going on in Gideon's mind? He's like, have you lost your mind? Did you not hear what we talked about when we came back, how God did this, and you want to make me the king? And then you want to make my sons the king? In fact, this is very important in Israel's history. Up until then, or this is the very first time that Israel has ever wanted a monarchy, a dynasty of kings. And, and in their celebration here, the Israelites had yet missed the point again. Gideon here, as we have said all along, just like all the judges, he was God's instrument of deliverance. But God is the agent of deliverance. For Israel to want to make Gideon king was synonymous to reject God as king. I read this quote earlier in a study Bible, and it has stuck with me because it is so true, no matter what level of spirituality that you find yourself in. We tend to elevate the instrument of God rather than God himself. We get so focused on how God has answered the prayer that that consumes everything about us and we forget the very one who was the one who gave it to us in the first place. We see this quite frequently in family life. The, parent who, the parents who pray for a young child that God would give them a child and, and God answers graciously like that. But a few years down the road, the instrument of God's blessing becomes more important than God himself when every decision that is made in the family is centered around the wants of that particular child and not what God wants for that child. We see this in our career fields. The man or woman who prays for a job, they know God has blessed them in that job, but before too long, if they're not careful, they become a slave to that job. We see this in churches where one ministry gets so focused, praise the Lord, we don't have this here. And we talked about this in staff meeting. But we don't have this here. But it's called building silos, that one ministry can get so focused on itself that they just want to build everything for that ministry. And the kingdom of God, if it gets done, well, great, but it's really about what I'm doing. Do we miss the, the instrument for God himself? And then we can even sit in our presidential elections, right? We feel that if our candidate wins, then God has blessed us indeed, and indeed he may have. But as time moves forward, the person in the White House, unfortunately, oftentimes has more attention of ours than the God who put him there. And in time, we are more driven, unfortunately, by how to get him reelected or elected in the first place than we are to the mission of God. Need I remind you of what journalist Cal Thomas once said here at Highland, I heard this a few weeks ago and it stuck with me, is that the kingdom of God is not going to arrive on Air Force One. It's true. So if you have been blessed in your life by the Lord, then it is the Lord who has blessed your life. Give him honor. If you have been successful in your life, it is the Lord who has given you success. If your candidate wins, it is the Lord who has worked in this. No matter who is in the White House, if you belong to Christ, he is your king. If none of that has worked out for you, he is still comforting you in the challenging times. And for some, there will be challenging times ahead. Know that the Lord is the reason for the success. And he is the comfort in the challenging times. And he is ultimately here the one in control. But there's a second reaction or action that we need to put in our life. We're to bring glory to the Lord and to serve others. Bring glory to the Lord at the midst of a time like this and serve others. Look with me in verses 24 and 20, through 27. And Gideon said to them, let me make a request of you. Every one of you give me the earrings from his spoil, for they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. And they answered, We willingly give them. And they spread a cloak, and every man threw in it the earrings of his spoil. And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold, besides the crescent ornaments and the pendants and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian, and besides the collars that were around the necks of the camels. 
And Gideon made an ephod of it and put it in his city in Ophrah. And all Israel whored after it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and to his family. So as much as Gideon has done right up to this point, he's about to do something that will bring a lot of sadness throughout Israel for many years to come. He asked from his comrades here to offer spoils from the defeat. Now the spoil here uh, was many different things. Primarily, we're looking at the golden earrings, right? Is that he collected between, it says 1,700 shekels, 40 to 75 pounds of gold had been collected. And he also collected the crescent ornaments, it says, and pendants and purple garments that were worn by the uh, kings of Midian. And, and even the Midianite camels were blinging. I mean, instead, they didn't have fuzzy dice hanging from the mirror, but they had some pretty cool collars that, you know, had gold and stuff like that on there. So, <clears throat> you know, they had tricked out camels, I guess. Um, so the offering of the spoil here was not necessarily wrong. There are two key instances in Israel history where we see that happening when they collected the spoil. One was a lot like uh, God had defeated Midian when God defeated Jericho. Remember, they were to walk around the wall seven times, blow their trumpets, the, uh, the wall came uh, tumbling down. But in Jericho, they offered their spoil to the Lord. Here they're offering it to Gideon, not to the Lord, to Gideon specifically. He specifically asked for that. But then the other instance is found further back in the book of Exodus is that well, all, all through Judges, and we've talked about this a little bit, but all through Judges, the, the Bible, the writer of Judges, is really showing us almost a second Exodus-like event because there's so many similarities between Exodus and the book of Judges. Deborah and Barak uh, is uh, uh, from Exodus 14 and 15. You, those two go hand in hand together. The call of Gideon is so much like the call of uh, Moses in Exodus 3 and 4. And then you get here where the, um, the, you know, Gideon asked for these, uh, these spoil to be given. Well, guess what this looks a lot like? They've defeated the, Israel, the Egyptian army in Exodus, right? And Moses goes up on Mount Sinai to spend time with the Lord to get Ten Commandments. And they have all the spoil from the Egyptians. They were to plunder the Egyptians before they left. And so they have all the spoil. And then uh, under Aaron's leadership, they don't know where, what happened to Moses. He's been gone for quite a while. And so Aaron, the priest, asked that all the spoil, or that a lot of the spoil would be given, and then what did he make out of it? A golden calf, right? Here's your God, Israel. Worship and serve this thing instead of the one who brought you out of the land of Egypt. This is what is happening in one respect with Gideon here. See, if you'll remember, is that, uh, that the ephod, he's asking that this, they would give the spoil to make an ephod, an ephod is this right here. It's a garment that was worn by the priest, uh, like a vest or tunic, um, and it was uh, to be used as sort of like to be able to serve as a priest. It was a communication method between the priest and God. Now, I don't know why Gideon asked for this. It doesn't really tell us this. It, it could have been that he wanted to make an ephod because he wanted to serve like a priest, although that would have been wrong too because there was already a priesthood. It may have been that. It, it, who knows why he wanted it? But what we do know is what the ephod represented here. It was made from the spoils of war. It represented to everyone who would see Gideon wearing it that Gideon had claimed victory over what God had already done. It was to be a continual reminder of their epic win. We tend to display our wins, don't we? We like to be reminded of the wins in our life, and that's not bad. You go through a hallway in a house, and, and we see pictures of kids and, and grandkids and maybe even great-grandkids, and that's a win. And we display those things that are important. Or, or, or our trophies that are on a shelf, we display those, those epic wins. Or, or maybe there's a trophy bug hanging on your wall. Or, or, or maybe there's degrees hanging on your wall, and you've fought that battle of education, and you've come out victorious on that. And so you display those things. There's nothing wrong with that per se, but if we're not careful, we become motivated by what was motivating Gideon. And here it is, personal success breeds the idea of personal privilege. Is that because we think, I accomplished this, therefore this is owed to me over here. Well, God doesn't owe us anything because 
what we see out of here. And in James 1.17, every good and perfect gift is coming down from the Father of lights. He doesn't show favoritism. He gives us those gifts. He is the giver of every good and precious, wonderful gift that we have in our life. If God has blessed you with a wonderful job, wonderful. But God did that through you, but God accomplished that. If you have a, a vehicle that you drove to the church in today, wonderful. You went to work. God gave you that energy and that mind to work with. How, whatever our trophies that we put up to display, may they represent Jesus and not what we think is important to us. Because Jesus tells us that moth and rust and all those things are just going to one day fade away, right? So we are to bring glory to the Lord and we're to serve others. That is the essence of what we are to do at this time in this history. No matter how God has blessed you, whether your candidate is winning or not winning, we are to bring glory to the Lord and we serve others. We're to make much of Jesus and no one else. Let me move on to the, number, the third one. We're to respond in the coming days the way the Lord wants us to respond, and we must realize that the Lord deserves our top priority, right? And that we're to use His gifts to bring Him glory and serve others. And lastly, we need to place our trust in the Lord as the giver of lasting peace. To place our trust in the Lord as the giver of lasting peace. Look at the, the last verse in our text this morning, verse 28 with me. So Midian was subdued before the people of Israel, and they raised their heads no more, and the land had rest 40 years in the days of Gideon. So this last line is very straightforward. Not much that we don't understand about this. The Lord subdued Midian, and Midian was relegated to the annals of ancient history. Never again would they rise up and be a foe of anyone after this. And just as the Exodus event would be used by the Lord to remind his people of his deliverance, this Midianite defeat would also serve as that reminder. Uh, Isaiah 10, 26 reminds them of how God saved them from the hand of the kings of Midian. And then because of the, of the Lord's defeat of Midian, the land had rest, as it says, for 40 years. That's the same amount of time as we saw in Othniel, the first judge. So only in the Lord's deliverance here, the, the principle that we're looking at is that can we find true and lasting peace? Gideon was a mighty man of valor. Absolutely. Hebrews 11 says that he's a, to be commended for his faith. Absolutely. It definitely took faith to put 300 men up against an army of more than 100,000 and to stand there and do nothing. <laughs> that took faith. And the Bible, it, it, it honors Gideon for that reason. But even Gideon did not prove that he is perfect. Neither will any other human being, no matter how powerful, knowledgeable, or connected that person or party may be. There's only one who was perfect. There's only one warrior king who proved faithful to the end. And you know who I'm talking about. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. As the Bible calls him, the Prince of Peace. And he made everlasting peace on the cross by shedding his blood and dying in your place and in my place. And he didn't do it with 300 men into battle. He did it by himself and alone. In fact, the 12 that he had, one set it up to betray him, the other 11 fled. He did it alone. And he did it willingly. He lived this perfect life for you. He died a sacrificial death for you and me. And he is alive today for you and for me. As the king of all kings, the undisputed sovereign ruler over every election of all time. He is our ruler and our head. We all have sin, but Jesus took that punishment so that we could go free. And people look for peace in all kinds of different areas, don't they? We look for it in our jobs and relationships and everywhere else. But it is only found in Jesus. So listen to this. Win or lose. Win or lose. We are followers of Christ. And we're not to get entangled into the affairs of men. 
because we are citizens of God's kingdom. That does not mean that we do not vote. We absolutely do vote. It does not mean that we are to be uninformed. We are absolutely to be informed. But it means way more than that. Think about this football analogy, and I, I didn't come up with this. I think I heard Dr. Tony Evans give this one day. But think about this analogy. We are mere referees looking at a different rule book, answering to a different authority. We may be on the same field, but we don't wear the same jerseys. We don't wear a jersey necessarily of one political party over another, although you may identify with that. But our jersey looks a lot like the head of our team, um, the referee team here. Or we, uh, we have our own jerseys that distinguish us. We may be on the same field, but we are there for very different reasons. We're not there to play a game and to compete against one of the other teams. We're there to point out the rules of the game and how to play the game. We do not answer to either sideline. We answer to an even higher power, the Lord, in this analogy. So the temptation here is to get sucked into one side or the other. Win or lose, Christians know that the Lord is ultimately in control of all things, even our presidential election. Win or lose, Christians glorify the Lord and serve others during, before, and yes, even after an election season. Win or lose, we are to place our trust in the Lord for lasting peace. In fact, listen to the, the words of this hymn. I love hymns. I'm so glad that we still sing them. They're good educators of theology. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace, his oath, his covenant, his blood, uh, I'm sorry, uh, his changing grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. My job as your pastor and the one who preaches primarily here, is not to get you to vote for one candidate or another. My job is to tell you what this says so that you will get ready to meet the Lord one day. And one day when you meet the Lord and you're standing before Him, He's not going to ask, who'd you vote for? His is not a democracy. He is the absolute undisputed ruler of all. And the only thing that we will be able to say is that although I deserve to be punished, I've placed my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and that what he did on the cross, he did for me. Will you be able to say that when you stand before the Lord? If you don't know what you would answer, in just a few moments, Abby, y'all go ahead and come on up. We're going to have a time of invitation. As we stand and sing, I invite you to come forward. The Lord may be working in your life, drawing you to himself, wanting you to open your heart up to him today. I want to encourage you to follow in obedience. If you know that uh, you have sin and there's nothing that you can do about it to erase that, Jesus has the answer. He died on the cross for you. He is alive today for you. And I would love to be able to share with you how that can be reality for you today. So when we stand and sing in just a few moments, you come forward. If there's any other decision that you need to make, then I'll be down here for that as well. Let's stand and I'll pray. Lord, we thank you for the day. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for what you're about to do. God, we give you all the glory and honor and praise for everything that is going on in our life, in our church, and in our world. We ask that you would glorify yourself and how you continue to reign supreme. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Would you join me as we sing our song of response?
have um, the Harmons uh, that are coming uh, uh, to unite with our church family and, um, and Nathan and Melissa. Uh, and so uh, you guys go ahead and come on up and kids, y'all, I mean, teenagers, <laughs> not kids. <laughs> So, um, and, and they're coming uh, by letter, and so uh, I'm looking forward. I, if you wonder ever what I'm talking uh, about up here, I don't always get to this point, but I try to make sure I, I say this every time, um, whether we uh, pray or not and all that, but uh, we'll, we'll pray in a few minutes. But, but I always try to make the point is that um, this is a two-way relationship. This is a family. And so I'm looking forward to how we're going to be able to pour into this family and serve this family and help disciple this family. But I'm also looking how, forward to how God has you know, built these two and how he skillfully uh, crafted and designed what they're to do in this church to help pour into us. Um, this is a two-way relationship. It's a family. Um, we don't want to just be served, but we also want to serve. Um, and so looking forward to what God's going to do in that. So if you would uh, uh, just, uh, uh, what am I trying to say? My mind went blank. I'm done with the sermon. I can't think now. So if you would rejoice with the Lord and what he's doing uh, uh, in the life of these family, bringing them here, would you say amen? Amen. It's not in my notes. I need a teleprompter, right? I don't know what to say. <laughs> oh, it shouldn't have been that funny. Come on, man. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, we won't do the walk by. Um, we're still you know, COVID. So uh, if you see them around the halls and all that, uh, make sure that you speak to them, get to know them, and um, they're, they're going to be uh, just a wonderful family uh, and what God is doing in our church with them. Uh, also, I have, uh, you guys have a seat real quick. I have a few announcements that I need to make. Okay, um, a few big ones here, uh, or a couple big ones. Picture day. All right. Um, everybody like that in school, right? Picture day in school. Uh, this will be less, uh, hopefully, less painful than that. Um, so what I would like for us to do is we're not going to do it outside and gather all together, like as tight as we can in the tight shot. What you're going to do is next week, um, you're going to come in just like we always do. We're going to worship just like we always do. And then there's going to be a camera up here. And then I'm going to say, hey, guys, just stand where you are, okay? And we're going to take the picture. Pretty simple, right? Okay. So here's what I need you to do, though. Not everybody has to do this, but let's just have a little fun with it. Um, we have to commemorate this, right? I mean, when's the last time we had a picture during a pandemic? <laughs> I mean, so, uh, so we're going to do one picture without a mask and one picture with a mask. I don't care if you put your hand over your mouth, whatever, you know. But this is going to be, our, we're going to put both these pictures up. Because in a hundred years, they're going to be some kid walking down the hall thinking, what in the world are these fools doing? You know? <laughs> so I want that kid to think, what are they doing? So two pictures, uh, one with Matt, one without, uh, next week, right after the service, right where you're sitting, and we'll do that. Also, um, we, uh, and we can't make, she did not want us to make a big deal about that, so we're not going to make a big uh, hoopla about it, but Miss Fran has... Um, uh, Fleming has resigned from uh, our librarian, and she has uh, been here uh, as our librarian, I think, since 1993, and so uh, that is a, a quite a long time, and I have said from day one when I came in this church, we have the best library and librarians that I've ever seen in the church, and I don't, I'm not just saying that to blow smoke. I really do think that. Miss Fran and Mr. Uh, uh, Elliot, they would read every single book that came into that library. And if it did not adhere to Christian Orthodox teaching, it would not go on those shelves. Mr. <laughs> Elliot read all the children's books, um, and uh, that's not... <laughs> I wasn't being... Elliot, I'm sorry. I'm not being funny if you're watching this. <laughs> I'm just being truthful. But uh, he did. He, he would read every one... Even the children's books were read through to make sure that it was gospel-centered. And, um, and so we're going to really miss them. If you see the Flemings around then uh, just thank them for their uh, years of active service and how they love the Lord and this church through that. But also with that um, is uh, we're, um, the nominating committee is looking at a new librarian that's going to take us uh, into the, the next phase of what we're doing. Um, 
and this person wants to uh, have a, uh, a team of people to help. So we need three people that will help open up the library, okay? Um, and you're not going to be required to read all the books and all that. Um, <laughs> We're going to work out a system to where we can keep that going, but that is important. But what we need is someone to help this potential librarian, uh, and it takes about 45 minutes per week. You would just sign up for one week, um, uh, you know, for the month or whatever. And so you're there, uh, I believe, 25 minutes, uh, I think, uh, before the service, about 10 or 15 minutes uh, after uh between you know service times and then maybe 10 minutes after uh, we are done. So if God, uh, you know, if you could serve like that, that may be something for somebody in here that you're thinking, I just don't have much to do. Well, here's an easy thing to do that we could really use your help, um, and you get to see smiles on kids' faces that walk in and get books and, and help, uh, help dispense uh, biblical knowledge to people that need it. Um, even our Sunday school teachers uh, go in there to get resource books. So three people, and you can see Paige, uh, Corey, uh, for that, if uh, that would interest you. And then the last thing, somebody mentioned this a few weeks ago, and I forgot, and I need to mention this, And um, but somebody mentioned, hey, can we... Where is the offering boxes and all that? I'm not saying that because we're talking about money, but if you don't know, we don't pass the plate in here anymore, but every time you go out of these doors, out the exits right here uh, to the outside, there are three or uh, two or three columns that have little slots in it. That's the offering boxes, okay? Um, you can still do it on Shelby uh, and all that, but uh, if you're wondering where the offering is, that's where it is. Um, and so uh, thank you for doing that. Look, uh, let's stand. Let me pray for us. Love what God's doing. Look forward to how he's going to use you this week um, in our world around us. Lord, uh, let's pray. Lord, we thank you uh, again for another wonderful day. We love you, and we ask that you would bless us with the presence and the power that is ours uh, and available through the Holy Spirit. God, fill us with your spirit to glorify you and to love others all through this week. God, give us opportunities to point, to speak, and to, to love for, the, uh, for Jesus. And God, we ask that you would use us in every area of our life. And we ask all of this in the Lord's name. Amen.